OK, cool. So yeah, I know the name was supposed to be controlling costs of cloud infrastructure, but I realized it made more sense for me to just write understanding costs. All right, so thank you all very much for coming. My name is, again, Praneet Waj. Um, I'm the product manager at Scalar. And let me actually start off with a quick poll. So please raise your hand if you're a software engineer or cloud architect, developer, programmer. Anyone here? OK, so a couple of people. So keep your hands up if you know the exact cost of running your application on cloud servers. Ooh, nobody has their hands up. Kind of, OK. So now keep your hands up or put your hands up if you know the budget for the projects that you work on and how much your cloud resources are being used and how do you actually follow this budget. OK, so a couple of people. All right, cool. Let's move on to the IT side of things. So if you're in the IT department, if you're a sysadmin, DBA, cloud ops, please raise your hand. OK, so kind of the same people. It's weird. <laughs> All right. So as you know, on the IT side of things, do you know how much you're spending on cloud resources in total? OK, so well, that's good. good. Good on you guys. So can you break down this cost by different you know, groups like development, production, testing? Eh, OK. So really what this poll has shown us is that there is a bit of a disconnect between cloud usage and cloud costs. The people who are actually provisioning servers and launching instances and whatnot don't always have an idea of how much this is actually costing them and how much it's costing their company. On the flip side, the people who are managing cloud costs, you know, the IT managers and then the people who work in the finance department, they don't always have an understanding when they get their cloud bill of, hey, where is my money going to? Yes, I know it's to these instance types. What, what does that really mean? So let's kind of talk about why this disconnect is there. From a very abstract level, the fact that the cloud is so ephemeral, the fact that you know, we're really breaking this traditional model of, hey, as IT manager, I know we're paying for an X number of servers in my data center. I know the fixed costs of this. I get this bill every month and I understand it. We're really breaking this model with a constantly fluctuating um, you know, cloud usage. Let's get a bit more specific than that. What is this, how is this really played out? Well, it's because of the agility that the cloud really gives to developers and engineers. The fact that this group of users can launch servers and terminate them really in just a matter of a few API calls makes it really hard to pinpoint where money is being spent. This is, of course, without the proper tooling involved for this. Finally, we've kind of seen a shift in the responsibilities to include DevOps really for being financially responsible with cloud spend. Traditionally, this was just the job of the IT manager to say, hey, we need to cut you off because you're using too much. Or the financial manager to say, hey, you're going over budget. You need to do something about this. Now that DevOps are actually involved in the launching and provisioning of infrastructure, they really need to, be start, they really need to start seeing you know, how much it's costing them. So what I'm going to talk about in this talk is really the tooling that's required to give, you know, bridge this disconnect between cloud usage and cloud costs. We're going to kind of talk about the tooling that we're starting to develop right now at Scalar. So you might be asking, you know, how does Scalar play into this? Why are we really even worried about this problem? So let me just give you a brief intro. So Scalar is a cloud management platform. We sit on top of these public and private clouds, and we really give you one interface to manage resources in all of these different cloud platforms. IT can come in, they can model the type of servers that they'll be needing, the type of servers that they want to provide as an infrastructure service catalog to their developers. Developers can then use this catalog to architect the type of server farms they need to run their applications on. They can also configure lots of orchestration rules, so they can also configure lots of auto-scaling using these you know, models that they're given. In the flip side, IT still has the ability to govern this infrastructure that's being run and enforce their appropriate security policies and access control policies. So, you know, as any good customer-driven company, we talk to our customer and say, hey, how do you like your product? And they were saying, hey, this is all fine and dandy. I can, you know, model infrastructure, provision, all that. But what about money, really? So where, where do I track costs when it's, you know, when I'm actually running this infrastructure? So, again, as a good customer-driven company, we started talking to real people in real groups of, you know, our users. And we were able to find three different types of personas, or three groups of people who really had a stake in understanding cloud costs and cloud resource management. First is DevOps. Um, DevOps really, again, fall in the category of software engineers, cloud architects, developers, all those people. And their main question is, how do I use cloud resources in a financially responsible manner? This goes back to the shift in responsibilities I was just talking about. And this is really that they need tooling that says, hey, when you're launching this infrastructure, this is how much it'll cost you. 
Second group is IT, so director of IT services, lead sysadmins, DBAs. All of them are really asking, what specific cloud resources am I spending on? This is a step above what DevOps was asking. This is kind of at a more general level, say, where exactly is my money going? Which region, which cloud? You know, what type of instances am I using overall? Finally is finance, and this was a new group of users that we really hadn't encountered before. And these are the business analysts, the VPs of finance, that sit down with the IT manager, and they really think about cloud costs from a more business financial standpoint. It doesn't make sense for us to adopt a cloud strategy financially. So their questions are more about, am I following my budget and saving money with the cloud? So now I'm gonna go into each of these three different user groups and really show you the type of tooling that they need and the type of tooling that we're building at Scalar. Please be forewarned that um, there is times where I don't have screenshots to show you just because we haven't developed the tooling yet. And also when I do have screenshots, there might be some numbers that don't really add up because it's all just dummy data. So please do um, bear with me for that. So let's start with DevOps. So the first thing DevOps really wants to do is before they launch any cloud servers, how much are they gonna cost you? They really need to have an understanding of the type of model that you know, they're launching and what it means in terms of dollars. So at design time, DevOps needs to have an understanding of the instance type price that they're using for the servers that they're launching. They can then multiply this by the auto scaling limits that they're applying. Um, this is kind of scalar specific in that Scalar allows you to set, again, auto-scaling limits that say, hey, you know, my database only needs two MySQL servers, and based on the traffic that I expect, maybe only five in total, or same thing with application servers. Once they put in this auto-scaling limits, multiplied by instance type price, and then you get a spend rate per hour per day. In this screenshot that you see here, we actually expose that value to the developers when they're architecting their farm, so they can see a spend per hour spend per day, and the actual instance count that they're using. So why is this useful? Well, this really enables developers to think critically about provisioning hardware. They can really ask themselves the question, hey, do I actually need a server that big? Before when servers really were just M1 larges, M1 you know, smalls, or this is a small service offering, developer doesn't really understand how much of a financial impact this is gonna happen. At the same time, this is also the lowest level, the most basic level, should I say, of cost savings that you can impose. If you teach your developers to utilize instance types that are efficient, you'll see an overall reduction in cost across your organization. Second set of tooling. After I've launched my cloud servers, I'd like to correlate usage and cost. This is really to help developers develop more cost efficient applications. This is where they can identify where it makes sense to scale their applications horizontally or vertically. Scaling horizontally means using more of the same type of server, whereas scaling vertically is using servers that are of larger capacity with larger volumes. So basically what DevOps needs is some sort of graphical tool that matches the dollar value to jumps in instance count or hours. Again, this is bridging the gap between cost and cloud usage. So in this screenshot you see, you can see the last seven days spend. This kind of gives you an idea of trend and you can also see graphically you know, the spikes that are happening and how much you know, cost is a result of that spike. So I've also put up Eurovision here because this is a real use case that I just wanna kinda of share with you. So Scalar is actually used by the IT department at Eurovision to handle their SMS voting application. So just to kinda of explain what Eurovision is, think of American Idol, but way crazier, way more European. So on the single day of their contest, they have um, voting that comes in via text messaging. And Scalar was used to auto-scale their application servers to handle all this incoming traffic. So what did the usage look like here? Well, they had you know, a flat, steady number of application servers that were running. And then on the day of the actual contest, there's a huge spike. And then the day after, there's back to this old steady number. So IT departments here really want to understand how much it cost to add all those application servers during the spike. This type of capacity planning allows them to you know, pre-plan for the next spike that they expect in traffic. So moving on from DevOps, let's go on to the IT side of things. So what does IT want to see? Well, they want to see a breakdown by time, cloud account, project, region, instance type, a whole series of metrics. So what do they need? Well, they need tooling to show total spend, spend rate, and trends for these different type of metrics. So why is this slicing and dicing of cloud costs that important for IT? Really, it's for them to identify inefficient spending patterns. 
this is really where they can kind of look at, hey, it looks like we're spending more on one type of server. We're spending more on one type of region. Maybe it makes sense to rebalance that. Let me give you an example. The first example is, of course, the scaling vertical versus scaling horizontal example. Does it make sense for maybe my you know, production cost to use a lot of medium-sized servers? Or you know, does it make sense to reduce the volume of the server count, but actually just use larger servers overall? Having a breakdown by instance tie, instance count, cloud account, really gives you an insight into that. Second example, maybe it's costing you a lot to run workloads in your public or private cloud, and it makes sense to actually shift that workload onto one or the other. This, again, by getting a breakdown by cloud, by region, gives you the ability to say, hey, this project is costing too much. Maybe it just makes sense to run it in our own data center. Third is to actually perform showback. So when the IT department gets their bill and sees, hey, you know, Joe in department A cost us this much, they can actually go to Joe and say, hey, why did you, you know, spend this much this month? Why did you use this many instance types? Um, did you already know that you were gonna spike in traffic and that you were, expect, were you expecting this influx of you know, new application servers or database servers? So again, to perform showback, it's pretty critical that, okay, yeah, sorry about that. So it's pretty critical that uh, they have an insight and be able to break down cloud costs. What else does IT, uh, IT wanna do? Well, they wanna model their costs to plan for capacity. So this is to use the spending patterns that they identified with the previous set of tooling, and they really need a calculator to estimate future spend. So what they do they need? A cloud capacity price calculator. So how does this calculator work? Well, you sum across all clouds your instance type price, multiplied by the instance count, multiplied by the estimated runtime, and thus you get your total estimate, or the spend estimate. This way you know, for example, let's say you wanna buy new cloud stack hardware. How much do you need? Well, let's look at my usage patterns. I can see that I use a lot of large servers. Well, maybe it makes sense for me to buy that many servers for next quarter or next year. You can also start taking into account reserved instances and spot instances if you use public pricing. Next set of tooling. IT department also wants to set custom pricing for your cloud instance types. This is really the use case for the private cloud, when you buy you know, CloudStack or OpenStack hardware, you don't necessarily know, you don't have a fixed cost to this. Sometimes it makes sense to amortize that cost up front. Maybe it makes sense to amortize that cost over a long period of time. So I apologize that this has AWS as a screenshot. Uh, we hadn't built out the CloudStack one just yet. But as you can see, um, it's broken down to, you know, by operating system. And here you can set your own costs. Really, one thing you can do by setting custom pricing is really incentivize the use of the private cloud or the public cloud in whichever manner you wish. Developers can then see that, hey, look, it's cheaper for me to run something in-house or cheaper for me to run this type of workload out on the public cloud and retain the heavier workloads in-house. For public clouds, you can also use this sort of custom pricing to really take advantage of reserved and spot instance pricing. So, hey, uh, yeah? Yeah. Question for you. What, yeah of OpenStack there, like what is the difference between all those OpenStack distros, isn't it the same thing? So, not quite, um, because they run on kind of proprietary hardware. For example, Nebula is the OpenStack distribution we support, but that only runs on Nebula hardware, all right? So if you're using a Nebula cloud, you can still use Scalar to tap into it. For, same thing with cloud scaling, they have their own set of hardware, which is a bit different than Nebula. And yes, it's still OpenStack on kind of the front end, but internally it works slightly different. I don't really know the specifics as to okay. what the technological changes are between just, them. Just curious. Yeah. So. Contrail is out there, by the way, so if you want to go talk to them. Okay. Now, what else does IT want to do? Well, they want to limit instance types and terminate unused farms. So this is less about understanding costs and more about hard forms of cost control. So why is limiting instance types useful? Well, really, this is just to reduce the usage of high-priced instances. For example, you have a QA testing environment, you know, or just a small projects that your developers are working on, you know, as an experiment. For these groups, maybe it makes sense to just turn off large instance types so they don't start racking up costs. So again, hard cost control. Second is a feature that we call lease management. This is to terminate farms that have been running for a certain amount of time. 
This is really to avoid infrastructure cost creep. This really happens when, let's say, you know, let me actually just tell you the story of one of our customers. So they had a developer called Joe. You know, we call him Joe now. Um, he ran a very high capacity Hadoop cluster for some big data projects. And after he was done running his tests, he just kind of left it running. He just forgot to turn it off. At the end of the month, they get a bill in the thousands of dollars. And they're like, hey, Joe, why did you do that? He's like, well, I don't know. Shouldn't there have been some automated system to just turn this off when I'm done? So that's why we came up with lease management. So this is, again, to avoid the use case where you run infrastructure for an indefinite period of time, racking up costs. Sometimes the person who started that infrastructure leaves the company. And you know nobody really wants to shut this off because maybe this is running something critical. I'm not sure. So really to avoid that fact and to really to avoid you know costs just being kind of, you know money just being kind of dri thrown down the drain, this is why you have lease management, which allows you to say, hey, after 30 days or 60 days, all your infrastructure will be shut down. Before the end of this period, you'll get a notification that says, hey, your farm's about to be terminated. Do you still want to keep this running? Do you want an extension or not? That's the purpose of lease management. All right. Now let's move on to the finance side of things. You'll see a lot more screenshots uh, with finance because this is the tooling that we've already started developing. The other set of features that I was just describing to you, we're actually in the process of building that out as well. So what does finance want to see? Well, they want to match their current financial schema of business and operational units and sub-projects with any sort of cloud tracking system they have. This is because the financial admins already have a system in place for divvying up these operational units and it only makes sense that when they allocate cloud costs, it just matches up with whatever system they have. So uh, how we do it in Scalar is we allow you to create a cost center with a billing code, of course. And in this cost center, you can have sub-projects. So a cost center can be any large operational unit. For example, R&D could be a cost center. Or it may be production can be a cost center. Inside this, you can have, let's say, experiment A in the R&D cost center. Any tooling that we've developed then for farm costs and allocating farm you know, usage rolls up to a project level, and then projects get aggregated into a cost center. So as you can see, um, the current cost center view, you have the ability to see how much your current month spend is. This is because we identified that financial admins come in at the end of every month and really see costs then and just you know, match it against a cloud bill. And then you have the ability to add a project here. You can choose the parent cost center of this project. Next, so finance wants to see trend data and forecast my final spend. So this is just how IT wanted to see spending patterns and divisions at a farm instance type level. This is for financial items want to see it at the project cost center level. So this is especially critical when they have a multi-cloud strategy that they're using. So for a specific cost center, we give you the ability to see the last seven day rolling average, uh, the median highs, the median, the highs and lows. This is used for the forecast estimate for this cost center from here on out. So for this you know, month, for example, you can see the total period spend, growth over the previous month and previous month spend, and once again, the forecast. You can also see a graphical breakdown. You can see this breakdown by clouds, and you can also see this breakdown by spend. So there's different types of graphing we have. We have line graphs, you know, bar graphs, basically however else you want to group it together and see it. What else does finance want to do? Well, they'd also like to assign a quarterly budget to operational units and be alerted when there is overspend. So really allocating money happens again, once again, at a quarterly level. So it's useful to see trend data on how fast or slow you're approaching the budget. And if at all it's gonna be crossed and how much overspend there will be if you do you know, cross over the budget. So here on the left side, you can kind of see an aggregate dashboard view of all the budgets and of all the cost centers that you have and how they're doing to their budget. For example, you can see that this is for Q2 and you know, since you're in the middle of April, you can see, hey, look, everything is way, way you know, on track to be overspent. You, right now in time, we're just over here, but the budget's almost been reached for a lot of these things. You can also see you know, the cumulative total, how it's approaching the budget line up here. And then, you know, when we kind of estimate, it'll get crossed. On the right side, this is for a single cost center, where you can see how much of the budget has been used, how much was used in this period that you're viewing it on, and how much is remaining, estimated, you know, as completion date and all that. Finally, alerts. Alerts you can really set up in Scalar where you can say, hey, email this person or email this Scalar admin 
when there's a percent of overspend that's happened or a percent of usage of the budget that's actually been you know, consumed. So here's a consolidated view of all the tooling screenshots that we just saw. So here, you can set up cost centers, you know, just add a new cost center, put in your billing code. You can switch the type of view you have from weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever. You see the total period spent, your trends, your budget usage, and then really a proportion view of where your costs went. This is a dashboard. Um, apologies, again, for kind of the mismatched numbers. We can see, you know, where you spent most money, which cloud you spent it on. Compare it to last month's spend. You can track it over time. And then you can also see the top five cost centers and projects uh, that are happening in your infrastructure. So thank you. Uh, I ended up about five minutes early, but do you guys have any questions? Sure, I've, I've got a question. Yeah. So ahead. I still am not quite sure if I understand how you calculate the price of an internal cloud versus an external. So the external okay. cloud seems obvious. I pay X amount per, per hour and so much for bandwidth and storage and so forth. Mm -hmm. But internally, those numbers are much more uh, difficult to determine, right? Most definitely, right. So this is really where we kind of put the onus on the IT manager and the person who actually manages the data center and then finance. They all kind of have to sit together and say, okay, let's price this accordingly, you know based on how much we actually estimate consumption, how much we estimate this to you know, really be used. So you're estimating based on the price of the hardware, the software? Combination it's a combination of, of a combination of both. Hardware, software, maybe even to just actually run that type of server in the data center. So would there be a place to enter that information in your system? Like, so if I spent X amount on my, so on my hardware, uh, and I spend X amount on my license for Windows, that kind of stuff to get a sort of cost Yeah, so analysis. you would do it on the custom pricing page, and okay. also to kind of, you'd use the cost calculator that we are talking about, the estimator. You would calculate out, okay, this is how much I see it being spent. Um, let me actually reduce the cost of you know, my private instances because that's really not how much we estimated it to actually happen. And this will all be supported for cloud stack deployments? Yeah, this will be all supported for all the clouds that we support at Scalar. And this includes both public and private clouds like OpenStack GCE, along with CloudStack, OpenStack, any other flavors of OpenStack that we support. Anybody else have questions here? Yeah. So you can put this actually in front of your cloud. So we actually have an internal cloud, uh -huh. uh, which is, uh, uh, it has different zones and uh, different uh, metrics within the different zones, different clusters. So it's quite complex in terms of uh, cost modeling. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you put this in front of your cloud stack uh, uh, environment, mm -hmm. um, so what we currently do is we just talk directly to cloud uh, to cloud stack. We talk directly to Chef, mm -hmm. and with that we bootstrap an entire environment. Mm -hmm. If you put this in front of it, uh, how, how do you do the reconciliation? How do you do what's already running out there? Or can, okay. can you take that into account, or will it only count anything you provision via Scalar? So really we kind of are limiting the system to whatever you provision from Scalar. So this is just one small part of Scalar. Scalar has a lot of orchestration and governance and provisioning of server features in general for the product. So this kind of just works on, okay, whatever you launch from Scalar, that's all we know about. So that's how we're gonna calculate costs. Okay, so no, no reconciliation, it's just, so how do you do capacity management then? You, so you don't do capacity management uh, on the cloud itself, that's for the cloud, right? Really, it's just whatever servers we can track then we'll give you a capacity estimate based on that. Yeah. Uh, sure. We are planning on, you know, in the future at some point, being able to actually talk to servers that are not necessarily in Scalar just yet, but until we get to that point for now, it's just yeah. So you don't have any plans to do uh, list resources uh, for cloud stack or stuff like that, or list capacity on the pods uh, you actually that's a, see? That's a conversation I have to have with my CTO. We haven't really thought about that use case. Uh, we're talking about really simple use cases here that we had to start off with. Yeah. Fair enough, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Did somebody else have a question? No, this is open source. Um, Scalar is actually offered in three different flavors in, if you include open source. This is the SaaS version. Um, if you come to our demo, you'll see the SaaS version. There's also an on-premise version that exists in your own infrastructure and just runs behind your firewall and whatnot. So, what, so it's, a, it's a VM you install kind of thing? No, so Scalar how it works is you install the Scalar service on one box and then you have an agent that runs on all other infrastructure that needs to be managed. That agent will just talk to Scalar. And what's the license? Licensing, um, really it's support based. So you can use our open source version. Um, otherwise, if you do use our on-premise version, we have a support contract that you'll sign. So, sorry, it was what based? Support. 
So it's, uh, it's not an open source license? Yeah, it's open source license. It's like GPL? G GPL, or? I think. Um, I'm not quite okay. sure on that. Sorry, I'm not meaning to grow No, 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 no. I'm just no, curious. No, 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 don't worry. I should be knowing this information. All right, so well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why they pay me uh, zero to do this job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys have any questions, we got uh, about five minutes to kill. Okay. So you're, One more question? Yeah. Uh-huh. So I don't have a picture right here. I don't have a picture right here, but if you come to our booth, I can totally discuss that with you. Okay, we'll do it offline then. Yeah, okay. sounds good. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for being a good sport, uh -huh. answering our questions. So we, we've got...